Let's bring in our first guest of the morning now, Navy Reserve Intelligence Officer Paul Chabot. He's going to offer a broader perspective to the current U.S. response to Russia and the broader implications of what's happening. Paul, by the way, also worked as an intelligence analyst in Washington. Paul, good morning. Uh, good morning. Great to be with you. And uh, I will not be speaking on behalf of DOD, but rather as a veteran and my experiences across this country and world. So thanks so much for having me. It is good to have you. You heard uh, what uh, Secretary Blinken just said, and it appears that from a dipl diplomatic perspective, the administration is saying all the right things. But from a practical perspective, what do you make of those comments? So it's obvious that uh, the two sides are going to meet, but uh, this is dangerous and we're in some perilous territory right now. First off, we know from previous history that Russia already has uh, boots on the ground in a covert capacity uh, in Ukraine. 100,000 troops on the outside is obviously significant. Russia and the United States clearly don't want war, but Russia is gaining, I think, the momentum in these conversations because there is a weakness right now seen uh, from America. Do we still have Reagan's peace through strength? Uh, what happened in Afghanistan, I think, puts us on a weaker footing uh, for negotiations of what kind of will does the American people have. Now, uh, McConnell, uh, you know, said some very important items right there, which are critical. And Russia uh, does not want to see Ukraine part of NATO. Russia uh, sees a threat in their backyard uh, should Ukraine continue its alliance with the United States. But there's a lot of issues going on in Europe, including fuel lines uh, that could potentially continue to fuel our European allies from Russia that could mitigate our European allies' uh, support on this matter. So there's still a lot of time. Uh, to see who comes to our side. But at the same time, the clock is ticking as negotiations have begun to ramp up. So, Paul, right now, uh, as those talks are about to happen or happening, do you foresee Russia really being uh, scared of either military action or sanctions or both? Or do you think they're kind of going to let it play out and they know what they're really already going to do as far as Putin's concerned? Look, I think they're going to let it play out. I mean, that would be their smart move. Our U.S. military and our allies could absolutely decimate um, the Russians, you know, if if we're there. Now, that would uh, be a very tragic event and a failure of diplomacy from the United States and Russian side because that's the end state that we don't want to see. But look, there's another player in this that we need to watch, and that's uh, that's really China. Look, China's not directly involved, but they are an ally of Russia, and China is bulking up in the Pacific, so they're also going to watch to see how the United States responds to this Ukraine crisis. And then we got to think about how is that going to impact us in the Pacific? Because we have another uh, potential crisis brewing also on that side. So how the United States demonstrates its strength, how our allies respond to this is critical for world peace. And I just don't know if we're there yet. Paul, one of the things that strikes me is that Russian's foreign minister said that he is expecting a written agreements from the United States or written documentation from the United States in terms of what was discussed today. Anytime you put something in the writing, that's virtually an agreement. So it seems that that's a commitment on the side of the United States to deal with issues of NATO and security for Russia. Yeah, it really is. And then the bigger concern is what are we giving away from a national security perspective? Uh, look, the United States pulled out of a 2019 agreement with Russia over nuclear arms because they violated those agreements time and time again. Russia cannot be trusted. We also got to remember Russia's economy is not very good. Their military equipment is dilapidated, decades old. Yes, they've had some improvements, but still they are far, far behind the strength of where they were during the Cold War. They don't want to fight, but they will win this if we put items in writing uh, and, and actually meet their demands in negotiation. We need to always approach this from a position of strength. But historically, in the last year, it's going to be very difficult for us to do that as a nation based on what's happened in Afghanistan. And Paul, one qu last question before we let you go. You know, I think a lot of people, a lot of Americans, a lot of people around the world are thinking that Putin's plan could possibly be, and I know that you're not speaking for the DOD, but militarily, since you have experience in, in that area, um, what's to say that Russia doesn't go for Ukraine and at the same time, China makes their move on Taiwan? Oh, absolutely. So look, uh, from a military intelligence perspective, um, it's all hands on deck, right? We need to pay attention to all of our efforts across this globe, uh, not just one flag being waved on one side of the world, all sides at all times. So look, we've got the best military on the planet, uh, but best prepared, best fighters, uh, best intelligence across this board. But what we don't want this administration to do is put our men and women in harm's way when it could have been avoided by showing a strength across the board. And that is where we're gonna see 
how the United States responds to this demand for putting things in writing, and more importantly, how are our NATO allies in Europe in particular um, going to speak up and collect around this united front to stand with Ukraine and against Russia? <laughs>